Simon Seabag Montefiore is a British historian, TV presenter and former war correspondent. Amongst his many best-selling books are Stalin, Court of the Red Tsar, Jerusalem the Biography and the Romanovs. In this episode of Secrets of Statecraft, I speak to him about his new book, The World, A Family History. Simon, why a world history now? Um, I think it's always a good time for a world history. Um, but in terms of turbulence, it gives a it gives a wonderful perspective that can be both consoling and and terrifyingly alarming as well. But I mean, world history, um, of course, it seems like a terribly hubristic project. But in fact, I mean, world history has become a terribly fashionable um, way of approaching history now. And in fact, one comes out virtually every week. Um, in some in, in some way, it, taking a different focus or another. What makes yours different? Mine is told through family history and told through families. And w- what I was trying to achieve with family history is is something that is missing um, from a lot of world histories. I mean, world histories traditionally, um, you know, are very good on on massive trends, on um, ideologies, and on econo- economic um, trends as well. And, but but they miss the sort of intimacy and grit um, of of biography. And what I'm trying to do in this was to try and try and create um, a new genre that really kind of combined the span of world history with the intimacy of biography. So, how did you decide on what to put in and what to leave out? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, really, what obviously obviously some of it is just what I think is important, but a lot of it is what I think is. Um, is, is, is what I like to write about and what entertains me. I mean, I think a great history book has to be both has to be both um, rewarding and entertaining as well as as well as scholarly. You write about nuclear families and and power families. How are they different? And uh, um, is that a, a worthwhile lens through which to look at this issue? Well, fat, you know, nuclear families, the basic family. You know, everyone has a mother and a father. Um, of some in, of some description, um, uh, whatever the quality of the parenting, whatever the era in human history. So nuclear history, uh, nuclear families are, 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 are something we all have in common. And of course, the book looks at the world through through those through what we now call nuclear families um, from the beginning of time right up to today. Power families are also nuclear families, but they also rule and. Um, and they're, they're in, in, in power families, the rules are different. Um, in power families, um, fathers and sons often kill each other, and um, and and children often kill their grandparents. And you know, the, one of the one of the um, parts of the story that I think is interesting and exciting is the terrible struggles for power within power families. But power families are nuclear families too. But your families are not just politicians. They're also writers, doctors, historians. Uh, how did you select them? I selected them um, uh, just through through their importance in the in the story. But also, um, as I said, you know, the book the book is filled with things that fascinate me, and the book really reflects my taste. It's, it's the sort of book I'd want to read. Yes, it's it, it's the sort of book I want to read as well. It's um, it's a fantastic uh, book. It, it obviously has to cover the superpowers, the present day superpowers: America, Britain, France, Russia, etc. But you, but this book really is global, isn't it? You you cover Cambodia, Hawaii, Haiti, Lithuania, you may name it, Albania. What does that tell us about the book? I think I think what one needs to know is first of all. Um, I, I know I grew up. The reason why I wanted to write this book is I grew up reading about all these countries. I was never just satisfied with reading about British history, though. Of course, that's fascinating in itself and important as well. Um, and I was always, always seeking new histories, new worlds to understand. And world history always appealed to me. So this book is really the culmination of a lifetime of reading and also travelling. And I'm lucky I've been to many of these places. And um, I mean, for example, you mentioned Albania. Well, when I went to Albania, um, Dr. Sally Berisha, the, the president of or prime minister of Albania, um, met me in um, the prime minister's house in the Bloku, which is the, the sort of central part of Tirana in Albania, where Enver Hodja lived. And, um, and it's the building where 
Enver Hodja had his prime minister killed. So during dinner with um with with the prime minister, I said to him like, "Is there any chance I can see the room where um, <laughs> Mehmet Shahu was killed?" And by the way, he was killed in the eighties. You know, while while we had Mrs. Thatcher, you know, one forgets that of course Eastern Europe was 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 a, a Stalinist dictatorship. And um, Albania remained a place where prime ministers were murdered in their own houses. And so the prime minister said, OK, we'll like, come upstairs. We all went upstairs at the dinner and he showed me the room where she who had been murdered by um, by Enver Hodja. Um, and, and so that's the sort of thing that's in the book. And that's the sort of detail that I love and that caught my interest when I was writing this. Well, you were a war correspondent, weren't you, in uh, former uh, Russia when you, in the early 90s? Yes. Um, and... Uh, you saw the attack on the uh, White House in uh, Moscow and Georgian coups and Karabakh and so on, Chechnya. What do you think that a historian uh, like you can learn from real wars that are helpful in a history book? Well, I think it's helpful for historians um, not just to spend their lives um, writing um, uh, unintelligible um, jargon in academic institutions, but to but to but generally to write um, and mix with a wider audience. That's one thing. Um, but to take that further, I think it is invaluable for for historians of politics to see how courts work and how leaders function um, in real life, whether it's prime ministers or kings or whatever. And you've lo- you've you've um, met a lot of those, haven't you? Because uh, Thatcher and uh, Shimon Peres, Edward Shevardnadze, Kissinger, these people crop up in your in your book. I mean, does it help you think to have met these characters personally? I think it does, and you you probably agree with me, Andrew. <laughs> I, I you've also do, known but, a lot of you've also uh, known a lot of interesting I'm, statesmen uh, in your time. Absolutely, but I'm interviewing you. <laughs> okay, okay. So well, tell me why. Um, tell me I'll why tell you it why. Helps. I think it helps. I mean, first of all, one of the things that are I mean, before we even get on to empires and which is a fascinating subject in the Russian the fall of the Soviet Empire and the Russian imperialism today, which is a great subject, which is treated throughout the book. But I think I think it, 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 it's a fascinating thing, but hard to understand how the courts of powerful people work and how power always in flux, always flowing to the, always flying, f- flowing to the to the most powerful place. Um, I think that I think that you know just seeing it in action, um, and obviously the more intimately you can see it, the better is is invaluable for a historian writing about power. So in all those cases. Um, I was very lucky to know these people. I mean, obviously Kissinger I knew long after, um, long after he'd been in power. Though he certainly ex- still exuded it powerfully. But the other ones I sort of I I I, I knew while they were in power. I mean, I saw Thatcher in Ten Downing Street. I I knew Shimon Peres. I met Shimon Peres first. I think when he was prime minister for the second time, and then um, and then as president of Israel, which is a which is an honorary position. Shevardnadze I knew um, when he was president of Georgia literally the most kind of beleaguered president you can imagine or under attack from every um side um barely escaping assassination and death in battle um and that was one of the most fascinating relationships i had because he he came to trust me and there was no other there, there were all the there, there was no other western journalist there at the time i was just i was just a young war correspondent writing for english newspapers and and, and the new york times in fact and um it, various times he said to me, "Why don't you just come along?" One time he said to me, "You know, we're, I've I've got to surrender to Moscow. I'm, others, others, Georgia will be totally destroyed." This is in 1993, and he said, um, "Would you have you got your passport with you?" And I said, "No." He said, "Well, you better stay close to me then, because we're flying to Moscow to see Yeltsin and basically to surrender um, Georgia into the Russian sphere of power." You know, we, they were hoping to sort of make it into a Western into a Western client rather than a Russian client. And that failed then. And of course, it would fail again later. So these were all amazing relationships. No, and I've put them in the book. I've lucky, lucky that in the last sort of um, 50 year period of the book, yes, I knew some of the characters. And um, these these power dynasties that you write about, I mean, we're in the age of the internet, mass politics um, and social media and so on. I mean, how can they, do they continue to exist? And if so, how? Well, I think there's two questions. I mean, in the West here, um, in, uh, in in America and Britain and France and so on, we slightly, we rather um, patronizingly um, and boastfully like to imagine that we are we are living in a rational, secular world where 
um, family family um, connections or other connections don't really matter. Um, but actually, I think we kid ourselves. And in fact, um, Camarillas and connections and uh, affinities of power, some of, some of them um, family-based. I mean, you only have to look at the Trump White House or, or the Bush family or, or the Kennedy family or the Nehru family in India, for that matter. I mean, there are many, many examples of these what I call demo, you know, demo dynasties where they're elected um, families. And that applies all over the world, of course. I mean, you know, Kenyatta's son has just left you know, ruling Kenya, for example. Um, Marcos's son has just been elected um, president of the Philippines and so on and so forth. I could go on and on. I mean, Pakistan is the biggest example. And North Korea, of course. Well, well I'm coming to that. That's a different, I, I, that's a different section. So, right. so demo dynasties are ones that are elected. You can get rid of them. Um, but people like, um, are attracted by the reassurance of continuity and the, uh, and the legitimacy, the political legitimacy of someone who's a, a family. I mean, Look at Trudeau is a, is another example in Canada today. Um, so that's one that's one group of families, and another group of political families are those that are really kind of monarchies and and really absolute and totally absolute monarchies too. And that that of course you've got North Korea, Andrew, you correctly mentioned, um, where Kim Jong Un is the third in direct succession of of um, of a family, and that really is a kind of um, almost works like a kind of medieval family medieval power family in the age of the internet i mean he had his brother he just had his brother um assassinated at singapore airport recently um so and there are other there are many examples of that too i mean in gabon the second sort of you know they're, they're now the second bongo president um assad in syria is probably the best known to us in the west but that 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 kind of government in Syria functions exactly like a sort of monarchy. What are the pros and cons of it? There must be some pros, um, some positive aspects to it uh, as well, especially in the de democratic ones. When you see Kennedys constantly getting elected, there must be something that the American people feel about the Kennedys that they like and which they can take for granted as are going to be seen again in in coming generations. What's the story there? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that it, 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 so we're talking about de de Democratic sort of dynasties. Yes, there. yeah, the pros and Demo cons dynasties. of them, of the well, Clinton, the, Mr. Clinton being yeah, president, and then Mrs. Clinton standing running for, for the president. president. Yeah. yeah, well, it doesn't always work. Of course, that's the great thing about democracies. But, but the attraction is continuity, reassurance, and a sort of legitimacy that comes from um, comes from familiarity. There's that word. Familiarity is a very reassuring. Um, feature and um and it of course it comes from family so there we are um and i think that um people all these systems are really about trying to in fact all political life much of the time is to achieve stability and of course family people that we know well that we're familiar with offer that and offer continuity so i mean you do see examples of where a, a leader after a long period of, of family rule in a democracy, um, you see you see someone who comes to power offering exactly the opposite. And you know, Modi in India was that classic example. I mean, he boasted that he'd sold tea at the station, you know, as a boy. In other words, he was not one of the Nehru family who'd provided really really ruled India and dominated India since since independence. Um, so so he was the sort of anti-family candidate. The fifty percent of people in any family are women, um, and your book is uh, is um, sort of very important in this regard. It strikes me because you have many more women in this book than in traditional world histories. Um, how do women feature in a in a world history by family, and who are the greatest uh, of the women rulers? Would you say? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, again, I mean, this book, in some ways, is is the most diverse world history written so far because it really does as you mentioned have all these kind of small countries and other countries across the world and it really treats um it really treats asia and africa and, and the south america for example in the same way that it treats families in 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 europe and north america um but another way it works well i think the family approach is is through gender and yeah women are very powerful in um in family in families as we know and um, one of the questions that people always ask is, you know, are women better rulers than men? Are they kinder? And are they kinder? Are, the gender, yeah. are there less wars? Um, are they are they more politically skilled? Do they have more empathy? And sitting as we are in London, 
So, I mean, so you know, Liz Truss, um, the prime, the premiership of Liz Truss is in itself proof that female female rulers aren't necessarily um, showing more empathy and more political skill than male um, rulers. And and in fact, that's a feature of the book is that you know one always presumed that there was there was there have been many arguments recently that if only men were ru- if only women were ruling um, uh, all these countries, there would be less wars. Well, you, you wrote a biography of Catherine uh, the Great, yeah. Um, yeah. which which slightly undermines that thesis, yes. isn't it? I mean, Catherine the Great is a big character in this book, of course. And, you know, she was an incredibly effective ruler. She certainly had amazing empathy. Um, the fact is, you know, people of the same gender have nothing in common with each other in terms of their political skills and, and, and much of their character. Um, women... Um, are no kinder or gentler or or less warlike than men. It's just they've 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 been more male rulers because of because of patriarchal nature of society. Most societies, though, in Africa, um, matri- there are many matriarchal societies, matriarchal kingdoms, which we which we talk about. But but and just, do they do they do better? Do they go to war less? Are they not how in are the they slightest. Different? Not no. in the slightest. And Catherine the Great is a very good example because. Um, she certainly she she wasn't cruel, and she didn't um, she didn't sort of kill people or torture people unnecessarily. Um, but if anyone threatened her throne, male or female, she was entirely ruthless. I, mean, I was about to say, didn't fifty thousand people get executed after the Pugachev uprising? Well, the Pugachev uprising was um, was a brutal uprising that um, that threatened the throne, but also was was kind of slaughtering thousands of people as well. Um, so I think I think in that the, the sort of the it it kind of the, the the scales of justice are kind of even. I was more thinking of like for example, um, there was a there was a woman who called herself Prince Elizabeth who claimed to be the daughter of the previous Empress Elizaveta, and um, Catherine had her kidnapped, tricked, brought to Petersburg, and imprisoned in a dungeon sort of below the waterline, pretty much um, in um, in Petersburg, where she died of either flooding or disease, but. You didn't want to cross Catherine the Great in terms of her <laughs> actual throne. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, and of course, her she had a you know she she overthrew her own husband, and um, and and though she didn't organise or, or order his death, I mean, she knew it would he was going to be murdered, and she, he was actually murdered in a kind of drunken um, frenzy by her lover and his brothers, the Orloff brothers. So, so um, <laughs> yeah, so power is pretty da- power is pretty dangerous. Even in a female, um, even in a female uh, uh, crown, are, are the you've written about the Romanovs, of course, famously. Are they your favourite dynasty? Um, no, um, I, I think I think I enjoy a lot of the dynasties. I enjoy a lot of them. I mean, there is there, there is such a variety here, but of course, there are all the familiar European ones: the Romanovs, the Habsburgs, Saxe Coburgs, of course. Um, uh, by the way, when Catherine the Great, when Catherine the Great murdered her her husband Peter the Third. Um, the official statement declared that he died of hemorrhoids, <laughs> and when D'Alembert was invited by Catherine the Great to um, to go to go to, um, to go to Russia and meet Catherine the Great, he said, "I don't think I can go because I have hemorrhoids, and <laughs> they can be a fatal disease in Russia." <laughs> um, now, another part of, um, of families, of course, is children, which very often actually people miss out in histories, uh, don't they? They're they, they're rarely um, key figures, but but uh, they do appear in yours, don't they? Well, tell us about uh, yeah. the importance of children. I mean, I mean, children are. You're right. Children are missed out in bargains, as are women often have been, and um, and so children appear in this book. And um, one of the interesting things is because I mean, pe- parents have always adored their children, but because so many children died in died in, in during their um, during uh, the early years of their life. Um, Children were, were were kind of left out of, of many stories, perhaps because um perhaps because the parents just couldn't bear the thought that they may lose them and and therefore did not invest so much uh so much love in them until they were a little older. And um and so it's really recently, it's really recently since infant mortality dropped that there's been a sort of cult of childhood. And in fact, in many families, children have really taken over, dominate the families now, which, of course, never took place in the past. Um, so that's one of the sort of themes that uh, one of the themes of the book is is child is childhood. But since you just while you go back to those female rulers, I just wanted to say a couple of things about them because it's so interesting. Um, 
Are they, are they, by the way, kinder to their own children than than fathers are? Not at all. Not at all. Often fathers are much kinder. But in all cases, um, power almost always trumps family love. And even quite um, quite modern um, quite modern mothers like Maria Theresa from the 18th century, for example, was absolutely ruthless about marrying her children, even to sort of even to sort of syphilitic brutes um, in order to serve the Habsburg family dynasty. And by the way, she's one of the sort of, she's one of the fascinating women um, who we, we look at closely in the book. And she is an amazing person. She really was a brilliant politician. You know, um, no one expected anything of her. Um, everyone regarded her succession as a complete disaster for the Habsburgs, but she held it together and showed amazing a resolve and acumen in running in running that empire for forty years. And also in the eighteenth century, you interweave characters and families uh, like Sally Hemming and Thomas Jefferson, um, Toussaint Louverture, and, and so on. Um, tell us about how you did that. Well, I mean, one of the what well, what I've done in this book is is it's a single narrative since caveman right up to um, right up to the invasion of of Ukraine by by Putin. Um, did you have ago. to end it there because you had to end it somewhere because you well, had a originally I publishing ended, yeah, origi- deadline? Yes, origin. No, I mean I was dying to end it somewhere as as soon as possible. In fact, but I want no, I wanted it to be modern because I'd always wanted to write modern life as history, and as I as we talked about earlier, I'd, you know I've been lucky that I've seen some of these things in real life, um, and so I've put them in the book, which is which is which is both fun but also gives an immediacy to the story. Um, I originally was going to end it um, uh, when the first person died of COVID in in Wuhan, and it ended there. But when the invasion happened um, uh, uh, in February, I immediately realised it had to be this. That had to be it because it changed the whole world. And also, Russia and Ukraine do crop up a lot in your in your story, don't they? They're they're in it all the way through, and you know, Ukraine really really appears. Um, from you know from 800 onwards and and in fact you know um Darius Darius the great the the um king of kings of the Persian empire the Achaemenid dynasty invades Ukraine and barely makes it out in fact and uh, famously of course um in July 21 Putin wrote that 6500 word essay on the historical unity of the Ukrainians and the Russians uh, which gave him at least for him, himself a, an intellectual justification um did it stack up at all that uh, essay? It struck me as being very strange and wildly written, and mentions Lithuania no fewer than seventeen times, which must be very off-putting and worrying for any Lithuanian. What What's your sense about about that and about his his worldview? Well, I mean, obviously, his worldview is very ideological, and it's really just based on a. It's based on the view that the Russian Empire is the superior civilization. He calls it the Russian world, and. It really comes from 19th century Slavophiles. I mean, he is a Slava, Slavophile directly from that ideology in the 19th century. He um, he regards um, Ukrainians as little Russians, which is what they used to be called by the Romanov and Russians in you know in within within Moscow and Petersburg, and um, the the, the Belarusians are simply white Russians, and. The southern Ukrainian um, cities like Kherson, Odessa, are new Russia, new Russians. So it's all Russians, and Russians are just one people. And so um, since he came to power, he's always believed that. And I know that because when I wrote my first book, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, it was read by him. And um, he discussed it with George W. Bush when they visited, uh, when when the Bush. I hope he didn't take your book as a template, uh, uh, Simon. That well, wouldn't be I very think, good news. Well, I it? think he did take yeah. it as a template. One of the it, it's fascinating because you know you might sort of say like, why on earth would a Russian president rule read some book by or be interested by a book by a Westerner when he has perfectly good histories in his own country? But that's one of the strange things about Soviet culture. The Soviet, the Soviets didn't study Catherine the Great at all. And when I went to the archives, there were no, virtually nobody had taken out those those archives for a hundred years or seventy years since since nineteen seventeen, because Catherine the Great and Potemkin were were very decadent, aristocratic, and fe- and of course female friendly characters. Um, they they really studied Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Nicholas the First. In other words, sort of male. 
macho male reforming czars who were like Stalin and Lenin. And therefore, they they knew very little about Potemkin and Catherine the Great. So bizarrely, they 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 read that book, and um, and that was in two thousand. So they were already fascinated by how Catherine and Potemkin took the annexed the Crimea in seventeen eighty three and most of southern Ukraine in seventeen ninety one, and how they founded all those cities. But to give Catherine the Great her due, she was not a a Putinist. Um, they were children of the Enlightenment, and their attitude was much more cosmopolitan and less nationalistic. I mean, they believed in a Russian empire, but a slightly different Russian empire, um, a cosmopolitan empire. And they set, when they built those new cities, which we're all reading about in the news now, like Mariupol, they filled them with Greeks, with Jews, with Poles, with Ukrainians and with Russians and with French people. So they were very, very international sort of frontier towns filled with settlers so they were a very different. They were very different from Putin's vision. When I mentioned Sally Hemming um, earlier, and um, that obviously brings us on to the uh, the slave trade and and other slave trades. You're you're not you don't just you you of course go into the terrible um, British involvement in the Atlantic slave trade, but you also cover other slave trades as well, which are often neglected. I think in world yeah, history, aren't that's they? That's true. And uh, and what I try to do in this in this. In this, you mentioned Sally Hemming, fascinating character, um, which um, Thomas Jefferson, great U.S. president, um, responsible for buying half of the Amer North American continent with the Louisiana Purchase, which was sort of decisive, really, in the in American expansionism, the creation of the American state. But he also had this secret love affair with his wife's enslaved um, African American half sister, Sally Hemming, who was who was. You know, thirty years younger than him, very beautiful by by um, contemporary accounts. So there were this very there are very few very little descriptions of her, and um, he started an, a, a, an affair with her in um, in in Paris, where Jefferson was was um, ambassador. And um, we know we know very little of the details of the relationship. Um, of course, all relationships between a slave master and the enslaved include involve encompass some coercion um it's not an equal power relationship we simply don't know how it worked between them but they had several children together and what i wanted to do in this is to treat the hemming family exactly as i'd treat the jefferson family or the family of toussaint louverture who was the the um the, the great liberator of the of the slaves of saint domingue the the french colony that became haiti and by the way you know, he was betrayed to um, to to Napoleon. Um, he died in a in a freezing um, Pyrenean. Car I've actually fortress. been there Have in you? that in that uh, yes, and it is freezing, and yeah. uh, and the uh, the rather large fireplace there was underused because they never gave him enough um, yeah. enough fuel. So it was an, it was a, a proper attempt up in the Jura Mountains there to kill him. I think. Yeah. And they did, and they succeeded. Um, he was a very, very sympathetic character. Um, he was betrayed by his own comrades, and um, and 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 of course, you know, one of the interesting things that this book covers is the three monarchies of Haiti. Haiti was not always a republic, and this is sort of this is under under um, reported and under narrated in history. But it talks about his successor, Emperor Jacques, Jacques Dessalines, and then King Henri of Haiti, who's an absolutely fascinating character, reforming autocrat of Haiti. So those are just some of the sort of um, perhaps lesser known characters that you just you encounter in here. Well, exactly. This is one of the great pleasures of the book is the extraordinary uh, heterodoxy of the um, of the book. You've also created a soundtrack uh, to the to the world history. You know what are what are the great history songs? Uh, you say at one point that um, "Sympathy for the Devil" is the greatest history song. What are the great history songs? And 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 is pop music useful for teaching history? Well, we're just sort of um, we're just uh, we're just doing that, um, putting together that soundtrack to the world now, as you as we're meeting here in London. Because yesterday I sort of launched it on Twitter, and um, thousands <laughs> of people, including some great. Men Many great historians from Simon Sharma and Annette Gordon-Reed and other people have all written in their favourite songs, which are included in the list. And I do think, <laughs> I mean, there's a serious side of this, which is the great thing about family history, a family world history, as I mentioned at the beginning, that, you know, we, one wanted to get the intimacy of real life. And, you know, that this is often missing in histories where you just get 
um, battles, downfall of civilizations. And what I want to get in all my history books is the feeling that, you know, what people ate, what people, how people dressed, how they made love, how they talked to each other, and the music that they enjoyed and the books they read. So this playlist is a sort of um, part of that, though, of course, most of them are um, commentaries on history, but you're right. I think the Stones, um, Sympathy of the Devil, I've put number one because, um, please allow me to introduce myself, I'm a man of wealth and taste. <laughs> no, so, absolutely. It's a, it's a great history song, great but, 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 but better than the great Billy Joel song where he goes through the yes, everything um, that happens yeah, in every single decade. We didn't like the fire. We didn't like the fire, 1953 yeah. Yeah. to probably to about 1985. Yeah, I, think, I think that's one of the candidates. <laughs> I also think, you know, Boney M's Rasputin is one of the guests and a brilliant analysis of, of Russian um, power politics at the early part of the 20th century. I, I hope you don't have uh, Abba's Waterloo owing to the fact that Napoleon didn't surrender. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you've got Elvis, you've got Elton John, you've got Mick Jagger, Sinatra. They all crop up in the book. I mean, music is obviously important then. I think music is important, and especially, I mean, I think it's always been important. It was, you know, in families, particularly before before television, um, theatre and singing in houses was, you know, singing at home was, of course, immensely important. And everyone um, from from middle class families learned instruments and could sing and could sing at home. And that was part of family life. But once it came to mass culture, um, it's easier to it's easier to chronicle. And of course, you know, people like take Sinatra, for example. I mean, Sinatra is a key figure in American political figure in a way. He's a sort of fascinating nexus of um, politics, of popular mass culture, um, of the commercialization of, of society. Um, the, you know, and, and the consumer society, and also the mafia, of course. Mm. So um, Sinatra's just one, of, you know. And I, of course, in a book mm. like this, I love characters like that because he brings in the Kennedys. And I suppose he, there's also a family element in that it was his mother, wasn't it, who drove him on, yes, and yes. Uh, and then his son also became a singer. Yeah. So you've got that uh, aspect to it. Well, as I well. think I think one of the themes of the book is that yes, there are power dynasties. Um, yes, there are dynasties of of historians and artists as well. Um, but we're all part of dynasties. We're all part of families, and um, and so the the sort of approach works just as well with people who hated family, like Hitler or Stalin, as it as it does with people who were part of massive families like the Habsburgs or the or the um, ruling house of Benin or Dahomey. And I suppose with Stalin and the way in which the um the Soviet Communist Party tried to get children to inform on their parents it was a classic anti-family um, aspect phenomenon. At least. Yeah, and as and, you know, another fa- anti anti-family um, institution it was slavery, which you mentioned earlier. You know, one doesn't one thinks of slavery, of course, in a Roman family, the familia that that included that was meant the household, and that included the house slaves as well as the children and the you know the brothers and sisters and parents and and grandparents, of course. Um, but basically, um, slavery always deliberately broke up families wherever possible in order to in order to exert co- control, and um, so. And the first thing that happened, of course, on the ramp at Auschwitz was that the family was broken up. Yes, and of course, another you know a, a, an underreported part of World War Two is that it was the greatest um, greatest slave empire in all of history. I mean, it it, it it's it's estimated the exact figures aren't known, but it's estimated that about twelve point five million people were enslaved during World War II. It's only for four years, of course, but that's more intense than and anything they didn't, else. They didn't know that, of course. They no, had no, no idea. they didn't know that, and um, you know, and the whole the, the intensity of it was astonishing. But of course, we we cover the Atlantic slavery, but we also cover other slave trades that that um, the, that were also um, if you were if you were a victim of them. Um, uh, you know, were were just as were just as gruesome and appalling, and you know that's that's the, you know, there's an East African slave trade, there's a there's a, there's a sort of Mediterranean slave trade in Russia, I and mean, the word slave comes from Slav. How interesting. Um, you often cite the risks taken by historians. What what do you see as the role of the historian? Um, I think there's a there's a great quote by Mandelstam, the Russian the Soviet poet, who said like. In Russia, they so love, they so respect poet, they, poetry, they, they, they kill you for it here. <laughs> and history has always been um, a very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous profession because, as we saw, as we see with President Putin, you, you quoted his 
his kind of dubious and distorted historical essay about Ukraine and Russia. But but history has always been, because of its legitimacy, because of its authenticity, because of its continuity, it has a sort of sacred prestige um, to justify what's happening in the present. And um, and so historians have, a, have an enormous power. And in dynasties, um, and in dynasties, and absolutist monarchs throughout history, including today, um, you know, the manipulation of history, the control of history is seen as essential. And for example, um, in Chinese history, historians are regularly killed by emperors for for questioning the dynasty, for undermining the dynasty. Um, there's also a great example, Ibn Khaldun, who's one of the great Arab historians, um, his brother was also a historian who was assassinated by another historian um, who was jealous of him. So, so history is a dangerous profession, Andrew. It, it is. There was, I remember though Tamerlane, when he captured a, a, a city and sacked it and killed everybody inside, would not kill the chess players and the historians, or the chess masters and the historians. So I've always had a little bit of a soft spot yeah. for, for Temur the Great. Well, Tamerlane is one of the, is a huge character in the book. And I'll tell you, it's it, it, fascinating. And, and of course, the historian that he really got on best with was Ibn Khaldun, who was like the most famous historian alive at that time. And um, while he was besieging Damascus, he met Ibn Khaldun, who was the prime minister. In those days, also historians were always politicians, and um, who was the prime minister of the Mameluk Sultan. And they had these kind of long conversations while um, while Tamerlane um, sort of sacked the city and ordered um, its bombardment, which was sort of shaking as off you know off stage as they discussed history mm -hmm. together in a very scholarly way. I mean. Tamerlane was highly intelligent. He also developed chess and was one of the people who was great champions of chess. But but if I can just say what's interesting about him is that um, this 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 book is dominated by about two or three families. Um, one is the family of the Prophet Muhammad, because um, his family ruled many many dinners through many dynasties, were all descended from him. And the Hashemites of Jordan are the last of those families that still rule today. But so it goes right up to twenty twenty two. But the other great family is the Genghis Khan and Tamerlane family. Um, the last Genghis family members who rule, actually ruled directly were the Baharans, who were only overthrown in 1920, 1920. But Tamerlane's family then went on to rule India, the Mughal dynasty. So, so he, was, he was part of a sort of, of, a, of a fascinating family, that one family that dominated sort of um, eight parts of Asia from... From about twelve hundred, right up, right up until eighteen fifty seven, when they were, when the last Mughal emperor was was um, was uh, deposed by the British. And what, what's the next one down? Would you say after those? Uh... After those two, um, no one really comes close to those two because because of their sort of multi multi um, dimensional uh, nature. Um, but I'm just I'm, I mean obviously the Caesars are one of the the families <laughs> are one of the most yeah. fascinating families in in, yeah. in the book and you know there are there are interesting um, there are interesting sort of sidelines to that for example you know um, of that era and the Ptolemies are also massive and I think that the answer is the Alexandrian what I call the Alexandrian dynasties which which I include the, the Argeids of Macedonia which is Alexander's own family and then the Seleucids and, and Ptolemies of Egypt um, and they dominated for about 300 years is is this a lockdown book I mean how did lockdown affect it um, with regard to your own family your, I think your family are in the book aren't they in some way I, I found the Montefiores are in the book um, because um, they appear in in various moments and and my ancestor, Sir Moses Montefiore, is one of the, is a slightly, I always regard him as slightly sort of comically because he's a sort of zelig like figure in the 19th century. He sort of appears everywhere. You know, when Disraeli arrives back from Berlin in 1878, having um, settled, having put the Russian Empire back in its place, um, you know, Moses Montefiore is there at the station waiting to, to greet him. Um, uh, as I'm sure you will put in your book, I undoubtedly um, will. No, but, but he appears everywhere. You know, when when you when you're talking about Muhammad Ali, the the, the ruler of Egypt, you know, Mo Moses Montefiore goes and visits him, and we have his record of that um, meeting. Um, and he was really the inventor of a sort of Zionism before Zionism, if you like. So so he appears in it, but also uh, my mother's family, who were just um, 
uh, Lithuanian Jews who were escaping from the pogroms also a- appear in it in the 20th century. So I, I think it's fun to put a little bit of family, but not much. And how about the the lockdown? Um, did you find did you find that those uh, many months at home were were helpful? Right. Yes. On? I mean, I mean, one I sort of I mean, as we all know, um, we sign up with publishers to write these books, um, and we're quite uh, we're quite excited by that. And then when it comes to actually write it, it you know, you, it's quite an awesome project. Well, it's an awesome book. It's how many pages long? 1,200 pages. So you sort of, same as your Churchill almost, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, and, of course, the Churchills are one of the families in the book. Um, Johnny will hope yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, from Winston Churchill and John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, right the way, right the way down Randolph to, and to so Sir Winston. Yeah. Mm, so yeah. anyway, so, um, yeah, lockdown was just essential. I mean, it was just... I mean, without lockdown, I don't think I could have written it at all because I just literally, it took me two and a half years to write this book. Normally a book takes a year, a big history book takes a year to write, basically. But this took two and a half years and it was a punishing schedule. But I was on my own a lot of the time. The family were in the country and I was just in this small office filled, piled with heaps of books in order. <laughs> and one day I came back to find, find that the... Um, that my my cleaner had reordered all the books. Um, what thought, in the basis of height? Or yeah, something. in the basis of height and what would look best together. And um, yeah. and so and because everything was in that, subjects. That once happened to me years ago, where where the very nice housekeeper reordered them on the basis of colour, yeah. the colour of the of the well, book that's jacket. What she basically did. And of course that I mean I mean I, already I was highly yeah. stressed by writing this book, and of course that caused a, a, a near apocalyptic um, breakdown. Last question. Um, the conclusion, um, it's it's the book is filled with with horrors and massacres and uh, and ter- de- terrible deaths in terrible ways because that is the nature of um, of, of world history. But you end optimistically um, this uh, this this big book. You ended optimistically despite all the horrors that you've um, you've filled the book with. How how can you do that? Why do you do that? Well, I think I think of course the book covers the dark matter of history, um, slavery, war, um, uh, a plague, which which are for better or for worse engines, the engines of change. But the book's also a great celebration of love, of literature, um, of human ingenuity, and that's how I end the book. Just to say that after all this, we live in a world of many dangers, growing and present dangers, and yet. And yet I end up with optimism because this book, above all, is a celebration of family, love and human ingenuity and creativity. Simon Seberg Montefiore, world historian. Thank you very much. Thank you. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work, or to listen to more of our podcast or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.